Warren, that's a great prayer uh, for our passage this morning. You, might, you must have read it before. Being a, a, a natural smart aleck, as you know, I must begin by saying I've gotten comfortable listening to uh, Mike and Alan from this porch. Um, I, had to, I had to wear a sweater. Um, really, I guess it was a down vest that I had on. When the sun gets up above the peaks, you can take that vest off, but that's a good way to listen to Mike finish up uh, the book of Proverbs, and what a blessing. Mike, I know you're listening. Thank you so much for uh, ministering to us like that. But uh, I see some new faces. Glad to see you. My name is Mark Newman, and uh, we're in the book of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, John. We're actually in the 10th chapter, so I'd ask you to turn to Luke chapter 10, and we're going to read uh, this morning verses 25 through 37. I've titled the lesson, Love on Display, the Good Samaritan. And if you look at it, and I apologize for the um, ragged schedule that uh, we've been on, um, and I think it's going to level out here. Uh, I know it is, uh, by God's grace. But if you look at, at verse uh, 25, um, it's sort of an abrupt beginning. So w what has happened is um, you had these 70 that Jesus sent out. And then in verse 23, uh, Jesus turned to his disciples and he said privately. So there, there was a shift of some kind there uh, in what Jesus and his disciples were doing. And now a lawyer stands up, so they've moved again uh, because it's no longer private. Uh, now there's a lawyer who stands up. So let's, let's start by reading the passage. A lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. I'm going to try to explain that in, in the lesson, how that's not a work salvation comment that Jesus made, but he, he does say, do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, the lawyer said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down on that road. You know, in the Bible, when Jerusalem is referenced, uh, it's always going up to Jerusalem or down from Jerusalem, both literally and symbolically. So by chance, verse 31, a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey uh, came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, uh, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and 
Whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. And then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. Well, so here's a passage that contains uh, one of the more uh, widely known uh, biblical uh, stories, uh, the story of the Good Samaritan, but its inclusion in Jesus's interaction with this uh, Jewish scribal scholar was for the purpose of illustrating something even more noteworthy, and that was the Mosaic Law's well-known Shema, uh, found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and its related commandment from Leviticus 19. Shema is the opening word found in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, uh, Israel. Hear, O uh, Israel. Shema Yisrael. Uh, the full text there reads much as we find it in our passage out of Luke. Here it is. Hear, O Israel, uh, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And the corollary to that initial expression of allegiance is the command issued in Leviticus 19, verse 18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And together, uh, they form uh, the highest ethical aspiration, uh, the response due to the Lord for who he is, the, the only true God. It is and was uh, the central affirmation of Judaism. And only underscored and given greater cause in the Christian faith. If Yahweh, uh, the God of the Jewish people, is the only one God, and the, if, if he's the only true God, then nothing could be more imperative and nothing greater than loving him to the greatest extent possible. It's no wonder that the Gospels present Jesus on more than one occasion uh, engaged in conversations about which the Shema was the main consideration. Uh, there is this passage uh, today in which a learned expert in the law uh, asks what he must do to inherit eternal life, and he's led by Jesus to recite the Shema uh, as an answer to his own question. A similar instance in Matthew uh, chapter 22, in which Jesus himself answers a like question instead of turning it around on the one who posed it. And again in Mark 12, 28, in response to yet a different scribe's question. Great teachers often repeat themselves, uh, said one of the old commentators, Jeremiah. Jesus had come into the world to fulfill the law and in fulfilling it uh, to abolish it. But there was an absolute continuity, as I. Howard Marshall expressed it, between the law rightly understood and Jesus' own teaching. For Jesus to preach that one should love and serve God in order to truly live he was expressing the Shema rightly understood and not crassly equating it to salvation by the works of the law, which Paul would later uh, demonstrate over and over again. But in our passage this morning out of Luke's gospel, there's the added bonus of Jesus' buttressing of this great sentiment with a, command, a companion story illustrating it the parable of the Good Samaritan. What could be uh, more important than loving this one true God to the greatest extent possible and then finding it within us also to love these others that he has made as he's made us in his own image? Love for God is a sentiment impossible to verify to others. I could 
stand here uh, till the sun goes down tonight and tell you how I love God. But there's no way for you to know whether that's true or, or not. And you can say the same thing to me. Uh, it's impossible to verify. We may voice that we love God until our throats grow hoarse, uh, but that doesn't prove it. But love for other real and visible human beings gives tangible and verifiable evidence <laughs> that there is an underlying love for God that, that animates it. To love with compassion another human being is to show that you have, as Peter expressed it in 2 Peter 1 verse 4, uh, become a partaker of the divine nature. And consequently, it is rarer than one might hope. There's a television commercial uh, currently airing, as they typically do, over and over and over again. It's from one of the major automobile uh, manufacturers, and it features uh, one of their representatives uh, making his way around a grocery store uh, floor in a shirt that is in, emblazoned with the car maker's uh, name. Uh, bumping into various uh, shoppers' uh, grocery carts randomly and, and then uh, enthusiastically uh, offering to buy their carts of groceries uh, for them. To great applause and effusive thanks and awestruck admiration. He is the generous hero, uh, winsome and likable, except it's all about him. It's all about uh, his automobile company. What he's actually doing is promoting the brand. He's selling cars. He's sacrificing not a single thing. Uh, that cart of groceries, the cost of it is nothing uh, to this automobile company. He's working the entire gimmick to his own advantage, but there was nothing in it for the good Samaritan, nothing. He had nothing to gain. Well, the scene begins in verse 25 with a lawyer uh, to be understood as the type of law expert pertaining to the Mosaic law, standing up to put Jesus to the test, indicating likely that Jesus had been teaching a group of which the, this lawyer was, was a part. What connection this had with what Luke has just recorded is not stated precisely, except that the overall topic seems to be the same, eternal life. Uh, in verse 20, remember, look there, uh, Jesus had recommended that his disciples rejoice that their names are recorded in heaven. And the broader context, and again, uh, I've been absent a bit, so again, as a reminder, uh, uh, the, the broader context has been the proclamation of the kingdom of God. So now this man has risen up to challenge Jesus. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit uh, eternal life? This was a common topic in Judaism. Uh, eternal life was equated with life uh, that would be enjoyed in God's kingdom. So he was testing him, uh, not necessarily in a hostile way, uh, but in the way a recognized authority might inquire of one who lacked those kinds of credentials. So that's how he was testing him, I think. And as happened so often in the Gospels, uh, the lawyer operated from the assumption that eternal life had much to do with human responsibility, human behavior. He wanted to know what he could do to inherit eternal life. And very soon, as you know, a, a rich young ruler uh, will come up to Jesus in the 18th chapter of Luke, and he'll ask uh, the identical question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? But this is the question uh, of every man. Uh, what must I do to ensure uh, 
that my future is safe and secure on that awful day when I meet with my own mortality? It's the most important question any person uh, could ask. The reality, though, is that in one sense, men and women already know what to do. It begins with the psalmist. He declares it in Psalm 19. The heavens are declaring. They're telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. Men and women are, are moral uh, creatures uh, possessing innately the sense of right and wrong because God has given them enough knowledge to pursue the truth about God and man. And we know, we know we should be giving this great God the glory he deserves in the way that we conduct our lives. That was the apostle's point uh, and his accusation in Romans chapter 1 that men and women suppress the truth. Verse 18, Romans chapter 1, they suppress the truth. God has made the truth known to them. Verse 19 of Romans chapter 1, that God's attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen in creation. Verse 20 of Romans chapter 1, therefore we're without excuse, Paul says. We know innately what to do. Uh, the problem is that we don't want to do the things uh, that we know uh, we should do. And this becomes clear in the case of the lawyer who will answer Jesus' question correctly. But when Jesus then tells him to go and, and do it, his first instinct is to get out of it. Who is my neighbor? That, that is, who do I not have to love? But in typical fashion, in verse 26, Jesus answers a question with a question. He said to the lawyer, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? Earlier, I called the Shema, the central affirmation of Judaism. It was recited uh, faithfully and regularly uh, by the Jewish people, and it was an essential part of their liturgy. Uh, the, this lawyer was not just knowledgeable of it, he was an expert in it. So it's likely uh, what Jesus was asking him was what it is he's always reciting in worship. How do you continuously read this? You know, what, what does it say? And so accordingly, the, the lawyer responds by drawing upon the Shema. He recites it verbatim. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength <clears throat> and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Now, the thing about liturgy, uh, we know this, is uh, the, the sheer repetition of it. Uh, sometimes dulls our senses to what it's actually saying. It's amazing. Uh, we went to an Anglican church, uh, Cindy and I did one time, uh, and it was wonderful. <laughs> it was all, it was liturgy, but it was all the Bible. It was all Jesus. It was all grace. And uh, it, it, but we were listening to it. We were, we were visitors and. Uh, some of the other people were more nodding off a little bit, but that's what happens with, with liturgy. Uh, it threatens to dull our senses to his, its meaning, but these words are, are, are profound. Uh, the essence of a proper approach to God is first and foremost love. That's the first thing in our relationship to, to him, to our creator, to our savior. The first is, is love, and not half-earnest love, but love mind from every fiber of one's being and resources, your heart, your soul, your mind, and in some occurrences of this command, a person's might is added. We're called to harness all that we are and have and apply it mightily to love for God. 
Likewise, love for our neighbor should never be less than the love we have for ourselves. And that's how we must evaluate the quality of our love for our neighbor, not simply with empty talk, but with actual deeds. The Apostle Paul himself was a student of the law, and twice in Romans 13, he summarizes it in, in chapter 13, verse 10 of Romans. Love is the fulfillment of the law. And prior to that, in verse 8, he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. So the lawyer had answered Jesus correctly. Jesus affirms that, but then he issues the zinger in uh, verse 28, do this and you will live. Do this and you will live. It was the Lord's answer to the lawyer's initial question, <clears throat> teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Answer, translate what you say into what you do. Now, I've captioned these verses. Some of you have the outline, verses 26 through 28, doing the Shema. Uh, part of that is me trying to be clever. Uh, but it does communicate that the important thing to God is not just what we say, but what we do. And, and what follows brings that out forcefully in the case of the lawyer. Jesus had brought him face to face with his shortcomings. Uh, and we all recognize that deeply disturbing feeling when there is no escaping the incriminating recognition that in some significant portion of our own life we have not excelled as we had misled ourselves to believe, but failed. We had failed. When we're faced with that realization, there are two ways to respond. We can repent and determine to remedy our shortcomings by taking positive action to realign behavior with the requirement of God's will, or we can attempt to, I think you can identify with this, we can attempt to manipulate our thinking and thereby regain the upper hand in this thing. And that's the path the lawyer chose. Luke tells us he began to attempt to justify himself. He would uh, resort to evasion. Jesus had the lawyer uh, back on his heels. Suddenly, he must have been thinking, how did this happen? but he had him on his heels. He, he may have pridefully thought that he had loved God with all his being, but he knew he had not loved anyone as he loved himself. The sheer breadth of that com command was overwhelming. So uh, being the bright man that he was, and again, wishing to regain the initiative here, he intuitively realized the only way he could justify himself in the conversation was to limit the extent of the law's demands by more narrowly defining exactly who one's neighbor is, and hence his quick retort, who is my neighbor? In other words, how about we lighten the load here? Uh, who do I not have to love? The, the, that, that person down the hall that torments me, the neighbor two doors down. Uh, who do I not have to love? Well, the Lord doesn't answer the lawyer's question, but instead tells him a story, a, a parable of sorts. It's the story of the Good Samaritan, and it has been memorialized through the centuries as the most penetrating illustration of compassionate, sacrificial love for another person apart from any possible advantage to oneself, or as we've often heard it described here at Believer's Chapel, disadvantaging ourselves in order to advantage another. And you know the story, it's so familiar uh, to us. Perhaps you even know its geographical and uh, sociological background. As Jesus tells the story, he begins in this way. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among 
robbers and they stripped him and beat him and went away leaving him half dead. In these days, uh, Jericho was about 17 miles from uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and as it still is today, it is a, a steep and rocky descent through uh, winding uh, bends carved around rugged terrain with plentiful hidden crevices in which robbers could easily hide as they preyed on unsuspecting travelers. So pounce, attack, and then escape into the surrounding Wilderness. I've taken that ride myself. I know some of you have as well. In a day in which travel in itself was a dangerous uh, proposition, uh, the road to Jericho was especially risky. But that's merely the backdrop. Uh, there are four primary characters in the story. Uh, the first, obviously, is this poor victim, uh, presumably a Jewish man traveling. Uh, and, we, and we must not overlook him. Sometimes he's ignored in uh, studies of the Good Samaritan, but uh, a beating at the hands of uh, cruel criminals would have been a, an especially horrible uh, thing. Since he's described as being left half dead, it was likely that they intended to, to kill him uh, after they had robbed him of every possession he had, including his clothing. And in their rush, they had not finished the job. He still had the breath of life in him. The next three people described are consecutively a priest and then a Levite and then finally the Samaritan. Um, the first two will represent in the story empty religion. As you know, you can feel it already. And the Samaritan, a man poor in spirit but rich in compassion. As you know, the Jewish priests and the Levites uh, were related to each other, closely connected by education and class, and that, yet they held different uh, positions. Uh, the priests uh, served in the temple in Jerusalem, and their principal function was in uh, the sacrificial system, making offering sacrifices. And while the Levites both assisted the priests in their, in their offerings, uh, but also took responsibility for the liturgy and the services that took place in the temple. And together, those two classes of people made up the most privileged elite among the Jewish population. And we'll say more about the Samaritan uh, presently. So we read in verse 31 <clears throat> that by chance a priest was going down on that road. Je Jesus was not really a, a proponent of <coughs> chance. Not really. So what we have here is Jesus expressing himself on the lawyer's uh, level. Uh, coyly suggesting that it was the beaten man's good fortune that someone actually came down that forsaken road while he was in that condition. And not just anyone. Uh, he was a, a priest. Jesus might have said, what luck. <laughs> uh, here came a priest. Actually, Jericho was one of the primary uh, areas, cities, rural areas where priests lived. And so this priest had uh, undoubtedly completed his priestly duties at the temple, and he was now making his way uh, home. It, it was then that he saw the man lying there on the road, but seeing him, uh, he passed by on the other side. Now, there's no reason to have included that detail uh, that the priest chose that direction except to communicate he wanted nothing to do with this helpless man. So he passed by on the other side. And the same must be true for the next distinguished man of religion who happened by, the Levite. Jesus relates that likewise he also, when he came to the place and saw the stricken man, uh, he passed by on the other side. So by chance, uh, two consecutive paragons of virtue in the eyes of society 
came upon this poor man on the doorstep of death and chose not to attend to him, but to avoid him. At least uh, two explanations have been suggested for their behavior. The, these are feasible. Uh, uh, one is simple self-preservation. If bandits had fallen upon this man and beaten him half to death, uh, they might still be lurking in the rocks above, awaiting their next victim. So the better part of wisdom would be to hustle along as quickly as possible and get beyond this juncture uh, in the road, and that speaks to a kind of self-interest that we could all recognize. The other suggestion is that both religious men uh, refrain from assisting the man because, as Jesus related in the story, he appeared he might have been dead. And consequently, uh, piety and the nature of their duties led them to fear a ritual defilement. Uh, through contact with a dead person's body. Uh, but those explanations, I call them feasible, uh, they, they, in and of themselves they are, but they uh, oppose both the details of our story and the general tenor of it. Verse 31 describes the priest as going down on that road. That is, he'd already been to Jerusalem. Uh, he'd already uh, fulfilled his priestly duties, and therefore the necessity uh, for ritual purity was not absolutely critical for him in the face of this poor man laying on and dying on the side of the road. But indifference was the real factor, as the story will suggest, and indifference is a kinder way of describing heartlessness. Uh, Jesus was habitually scorned by the religious leaders of his day because he didn't hesitate to lay bare their hypocrisy. Uh, remember uh, in Matthew chapter 23 in that section with all the woes, woe to you, woe to you for various reasons, uh, Jesus hammered them for that specific uh, and explicit reason. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, he reproached them. Uh, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These two representatives of religion are inserted into the story by the Lord for their lack of love. Their failure was not so much prioritizing self-preservation or legalistic scruples, but the neglect of mercy. They acted solely out of self-concern, apart from compassion, advantaging self to the disadvantage of the poor man. Well, at this point in uh, the story, uh, approaching verse 33 now, uh, the lawyer might have expected a, a simple Israelite layman uh, to happen along, highlighting the general disregard people of the day had for the clergy. It was quite a surprise then for a certain Samaritan to enter the scene in Jesus' story. Jesus stresses it even. You can see this in, in, in the original language. He stresses it by uttering the person's identity first. A Samaritan, though, they might not even have... Uh, heard the rest of it. They would have been so surprised. The lawyer would have been so surprised, but he stresses it uh, by saying it first. A Samaritan, though, on a journey, came upon the near dead man and seeing him felt compassion. We won't take the time to uh, review the history that led to the severe antipathy between Jew and Samaritan, but you've read your New Testaments. This group has read your New Testaments enough to know that it was a, a ruptured relationship. Uh, they did not like each other or respect each other or have anything to do with each other. Remember the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, and John tells us, uh, the situation, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. They have no dealings with them. Another illustration, 
It was only just uh, prior to this in chapter 9 and verse 54 uh, when Jesus had sent some followers into a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for his arrival there and the townspeople refused to uh, receive him. That James and John uh, indignantly suggested that they command fire to come down from heaven and consume them. Uh, but Jesus uh, rebuked them, and saying, you do, know, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So ironically, then uh, and now, the, the Good Samaritan gives us a picture of that very spirit that Jesus had been uh, talking about, the spirit of love uh, for others. Jesus states in verse 33 that when the Samaritan saw the man on the side of the road, he felt compassion. Here is the key to the story of the good Samaritan, and we must not miss it. His heart went out to this Jewish man, and in that attitude, he showed himself to be like Jesus. Uh, Luke has told us the story in Luke chapter 7 of the widow of Nain. You remember that. Uh, this poor woman had lost her only son, a widow, now no, her only child. And as Jesus saw the dead son being carried out to be buried, Luke says that Jesus felt compassion for her. It's the same uh, Greek verb as here, indicating a feeling of love and pity that arises literally from one's inward parts. We, we might say it came, it came from his gut. It came straight up from his gut. Unlike the priest and the Levite, this is what the Samaritan felt when he saw the wounded man on the road. He felt as Jesus felt. That's, that's, that's amazing. That's what it is. But he didn't only feel, he responded. Love and compassion must not be defined as mere sen <coughs> sentiment. They're revealed only through action. So the story continues in verse 34. Rather than passing the man by on the other side, the Samaritan came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. His pity was translated into sacrificial action. This was inconvenient. Listen, convenience is the bane of our, our Christian life. Don't dare inconvenience uh, me. Uh, don't dare inconvenience uh, what we've got planned. But this was inconvenient. Whatever journey he was on, he had not made calculation for this delay and distraction. But he gave no consideration to racial disparity or to a, a hoped audience for his generosity or to anything other than what he would have desired were the shoe on the other foot. He loved the wounded stranger as he loved himself. So he took what he had on him, some oil and wine for his travels, and he poured them into the injured man's uh, wounds. What he used to bandage the man, we can only assume, was torn pieces of his own uh, clothing. <clears throat> the man was too weak to walk, and so the Samaritan mounted him on his own donkey and brought him to the inn where Jesus says he took care of him, a, a phrase uh, intentionally broad enough to cover every possible need the man had. And then uh, when after resting for the night, he needed to continue on his journey, his largesse continued. He took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, said, take care of him, whatever you spend when I return, whatever more you spend when I return, I'll, I'll pay you back. Now it was, it's generally thought at the time that a, a day's room and board cost about a, a twelfth of a denarius. So this man was more than generous. He, he was leaving, he paying the innkeeper enough money uh, to keep this man for, for weeks. This was love and compassion 
unveiled. Uh, it was love at work. And then the final two verses uh, bring us back to the actual uh, setting, the lawyer's evasion of Jesus' challenge, wishing to justify himself. He had said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? But that was not the relevant question. In fact, the story Jesus told him, notice, answers the meaning of love rather than neighbor. The Lord changed the narrative on him. He turns it into an, uh, from an objective question, who is my neighbor, to a subjective one, to whom am I a neighbor? Not who do I have to love, but how does a neighbor act? The lawyer's wishful diversion about who exactly qualified to be his neighbor was a red herring. And Jesus responded to it with something of a bait and switch. Revealed now in verse 36 by Jesus' question, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? There was only one answer the chastened lawyer could give, the one who showed mercy uh, toward him. A neighbor is merciful. That's a truth that one must grasp if he is to understand the parable. Uh, for Jesus' parables invariably demand a change in behavior, a change in attitude in his listeners. That means each of us today, we've heard his parable. And we must ask ourselves, what change is the Lord uh, does the Lord have in store for me because of this story of the Good Samaritan? The Greek word translated mercy, when used of God's mercy, uh, normally speaks to his compassionate and loving withholding of the punishment that we deserve because of our sin. When used of the mercy expected from followers of Jesus, it points to the compassionate pity uh, we're expected to extend to others who are suffering from the many afflictions that beset us. As Christ is merciful, so those who have received his mercy are to be merciful to others. That's one of the Beatitudes, right? It's not to be withheld selfishly or dispensed grudgingly or in a miserly manner, or in a discriminating way. Mercy is not a respecter of persons. So again, the lawyer had answered correctly, and Jesus acknowledged it. He said to him, go and do the same. So notice, we're back to verse 28. <laughs> Do it. Do the Shema. Remember, the overall theme of this section of the gospel is the kingdom of God and the eternal life that belongs to kingdom citizens. The lawyer had wanted to know what he must do to attain to that, and Jesus' parable reveals that the ultimate evaluation will have to be based on more than mere words. It is one's deeds that prove the reality of one's confession. This is not salvation by works. It is working out one's salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who is at work within us, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It's the mark of Christ's followers. I've seen it uh, this past year myself. Cindy and I have seen it this past year uh, in simply astounding ways as God's people have literally come out of the woodwork to lavish upon us uh, mercy and pity and compassion. You've been doing the Shema, and it's beautiful. And it's the story of the Good Samaritan doing the Shema.
Let's pray. Lord, we do want to be doers of your word and not merely hearers. And we know that we can only do that uh, by the, the minister of your Holy Spirit. So as we leave here, we pray for that. We're accustomed uh, to making resolutions and um, uh, making determination. We're going to turn the corner and do things differently, and we're going to love better and be more compassionate and me be more generous. We're accustomed to those uh, resolutions, um, but we're also accustomed to falling back into our own uh, behavior patterns. And Father, we pray that you would, um, I know you call it sanctification, uh, setting us more and more apart for your service. So will you do that for us? You've done so much for us already. Uh, you've shown so much mercy for us. May we uh, turn and show it to others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.